Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, April 13th. We will be picking up in Chapter 4 of Genesis. We're actually making a little bit of progress. Uh, but I'm going to back us up just slightly to the end of Chapter 3. As we finished off class last week, we were talking about the Garden of Eden. Where is it now? Where are the trees that, that were in the garden? Then we saw the, the trees in Sheol, in the Paradise side. And then we saw how paradise is up in heaven. That we talked about how the change came from Sheol being in the heart of the earth to being in heaven with God so that when we're absent from this body and we go to be with the Lord, we're going up to heaven. We're not going into the heart of the earth. We talked about how the suffering side has not been moved. It will be brought out at the great white throne judgment for those people who are in it to be judged according to their deeds. So greater evils deserve greater punishment and that is when they will be cast in the lake of fire to what we call hell forever according to what they have earned for themselves what i failed to follow through on and why i want to bring this up today is i had talked about how the lord took his blood when he resurrected that he took his blood and put it on the mercy seat in heaven that's when he was able to open heaven for us to come in because now perfect blood the requirement of god for our to, to wash away our sin had been placed in the heavenlies and why heaven could be open i gave the example or i started not the example the the showing you from scripture i talked about how when yeshua first rose and was in the garden area and mary i call her miriam because that's my hebrew saw who she presumed to be the gardener she was in such emotional just crying buckets her her savior the one she loved not only had died but now she thought that somebody had stolen his body and she's just crushed agony upon agony she hears him call her by name in that she knew instantly this was her master this was the one she loved and she did what any of us would want to do want to grab hold and hug and she started to grab hold of him and our Greek says that the Lord told her stop clinging to me I've not yet ascended unto my father and he tells her go tell his other followers what she has seen this is the part I forgot to bring out last week a little bit later in that that succession not long you have some other women where the Lord appears to them and he allows them to cling to him. He doesn't stop them from it. So obviously a change has taken place. Obviously he, he held Miriam off so he'd go to heaven without anything, I, I don't want to say contaminating, but without, you know, just trying to, to keep it in that pure state. Obviously he had accomplished that task if he's now not stopping the people from clinging to him holding on to him. He sees Thomas a little bit after that and he tells Thomas, touch, feel, put your hand in my sight. There's been a change that's taken place. He finished his mission of placing his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. He'd come back. We don't see that. We don't read that, but we can realize that's what took place in between those occurrences of his appearance to other people here on this earth. That again gives us proof that there's been a motion made into heaven and heaven has been opened up. We, we know we looked at last week the captives being carried through Satan's domain and that we talked about how he is the principality, the power of the air and I can see how the Lord would make a way through because he is the way and he brings those home that were with him. And now individually, each one now, a believer who, who sheds this shell here on this earth, we go through the way the Lord has prepared into heaven safely. No one gets lost on the way. No one gets harmed on the way. Satan can't touch them on the way. Remember I said it's almost, it's not nice, but it's almost like if it was slow enough and if we wanted that we could look to the sides of Satan's territory for now and go nah, 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 nah. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm going through <laughs> however you want to put it 
I don't think we're going to have that human aspect about us in that moment that it takes us to get from earth to heaven because I don't believe it's a slow process, but you understand. We're just, our hearts are delighting that the one who has been a thorn in our flesh, who has buffeted us every day of our spiritual lives, we are now able to, to triumph mightily and openly through his domain claiming our God won. He's victor. Hallelujah. And when we think about what's coming this Sunday, one of my favorite days on the, the um, Gregorian calendar, the Christian calendar, which also is on my Jewish calendar. You, we just don't call it by the same name, but we've got the first fruits. We've got Passover, we've got unleavened bread, and then we've got first fruits. And we know Yeshua Jesus in Scripture has said he is the first fruits of the resurrection from the dead. He is the first that, that conquered and paid the penalty of sin, which is death, and resurrected, showing victory over that. And that's why Sunday we shout, and I say shout it every day, He arose. He is alive. Hallelujah. We serve a living God. Was he dead before? No. The human flesh of Yeshua Jesus laid in the tomb. But remember, he told the thief, you'll be with me in paradise. There's no soul sleep. There's no dead. He was alive. But coming out and showing the world that victory, that's the hallelujah, that's the high priest coming back, now dressed in the regal again, saying to the children of Israel, the sacrifice was accepted. When we see him in his glory, we know the sacrifice was accepted. Hallelujah. What a day. So maybe it's good I didn't finish the thought so we could have that and let that be the focus of your thoughts on this weekend. And especially realize that with Pesach, Passover right here, the lamb that we know represents Yeshua, almost precisely in time on our two calendars this year a little bit off but very very close so you can think about him when you think about yeshua being crucified you can know it's very close to the time that the lambs would have been being slaughtered and then you can look at that resurrection and if you've seen the garden tomb in israel if you've been there in person or seen it in pictures there used to be a door there and it said he is risen he is not here he is risen and I love it. I want to constantly tell people, my God is alive. That's what separates him from every other God. There is not one other God that is alive. My God is alive. Okay, off my soapbox. I hope, I don't know. Hallelujah. <laughs> I gotta let one more out. Let's look at chapter four now. We ended in chapter three with the difference between the tree of knowledge and the price that that was, because that wasn't good knowledge, that was knowledge of good and evil. And we compared it to the tree of crucifixion. We saw that that tree is what really brings us life. We know that the tree of life was cut off from access for Adam and Eve. In fact, I think because of today, it's very important that I bring that out to your remembrance. Adam and Eve were drawn, dr driven out of the Garden of Eden and there was an, at least an angel, it sounds like two cherry beam at the gate to the garden with a flaming sword, lest Adam and Eve go back to that tree of life, eat it, and live forever in this sinful state. And again, hallelujah that we do not, because this body suffers, this body wears down. It, it would be horrible to live in these circumstances and the atrocities that we hear and that we see around us in a world that's getting worse all the time. To think that this is it forever? I would want no part of that. that that's so appalling I can't hardly fathom it. But God did not want them to stay in that state. They are going to suffer the consequences of sin, which is death now comes to the human race. We know that, that with the only exception will be those alive in the day of rapture. Otherwise, when you're born, you die. Fact. We know that. And yet, God in His mercy, extended mercy, because that tree of life that we saw go down apparently into Sheol, that we know is at the throne of God in heaven, that we will eat from forever, it sounds like, in eternity. We know that God does want us to be alive forever, just not in a sin-soaked state. 
and he brought in his mercy to Adam and Eve at the very time that they needed it, even before he let them know the fullness of the, the uh, penalty of their disobedience, he taught to them about his mercy. He taught them about being that sacrifice. And now as we come into chapter 4, we're going to see things get worse, but it's going to give us a hint of something that I think is taking place still very close to that garden entrance. Now this is not something that I can say, here is scripture and verse. But follow my thought and see if you don't come to the same conclusion. But before we get there, we kind of have to go through a little bit of the worse again. Kind of like our world right now. We're going to look in chapter 4 at these two sons, Cain and Aval, again Cain and Abel. We're going to see that they are symbolic <coughs> of the conflict, of the warfare that God spoke about in Genesis 3.15 when he said that there would be enmity between Satan and his seed and the woman and her seed. And we know specifically her seed is Yeshua. So those who are in the Lord, there's going to be enmity with Satan and his cohorts, his followers. There's war between them and we know that is true even today. Kion, King's line, his seed, he's called the seed of the serpent or represented by the seed of the serpent in 1 John 3.12. Contrast that with the seed of the woman that I just told you is Messiah himself. Well, 1 John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12 says, not as, and I'll just say it in English, not as Cain, who was the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Okay, so he's doing deeds that are evil because he's of the evil one who is sowing evil deeds. We know that's Satan. Satan here is the opposite of God. Where God does not do evil, Satan, that's all he does is evil. So Kion, Cain, is going to represent the serpent's seed, evil, evildoers, evil deeds. And he's at war with the seed of the woman who is going to be represented by Aval, by Abel, by the one who was righteous according to what we just read in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. Back to Genesis now, we'll look at verse 1, chapter 4. The man, or now the man, had relations, had sexual relations with his wife, Chava, in Hebrew, Eve in English. The mother of all living remembers what it means. So he, they came together and she conceived and gave birth to Kion, to Cain. And she said, I've gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Okay, let's break this down. Kion, the name Cain in our Hebrew means to acquire or acquisition, to, to get this, to acquire this. Apparently, by what she named him, we think that Chava, Eve, thought that she had just given birth to the promised redeemer. God promised one would come in, here he is. I've got a male child. I've, I've, I've acquired what God talked to us about. But we're going to see that he was, instead of that seed, he's going to be a type of what I'll call the earthly man, the sinful man, and the earthly birth has to come before we can have our spiritual birth. We can't be saved spiritually if we haven't been born physically. But if you're born twice, you only die once. Because if you're born physically and spiritually, then you live forever in heaven with the Lord. So we see a huge difference between the spiritual man and spiritual life and the earthly man and the sinful life, I will call it. Okay, so. The, the earthly man has to come first, then he can become a spiritual man through the way of salvation that, that the Lord has made available to us. So he just thought, wow, I've got the answer right here already. How little did she know? How wonderful she didn't know. I cannot imagine if God had said to her, oh, by the way, that seed won't come for several thousand years. I think I'd just give up, sit down, and say it's all over right there. <laughs> Sometimes God blinds us to time <laughs> for our own sake. Um, even, even the hope of his return available to each and all of us through our lifetime because we don't know exactly when. But we have great reason to believe it could be today. 
<coughs> that she fully believed in, and of course rightfully so that she had received this son, gotten this son with the help of the Lord or from the Lord. In the Hebrew it's from Adonai, which is Lord. We can also see in that though, Yehovah, the one who provides. So she gave credit to the Lord for her being able to have this male child. And she's right on that, just wrong on who he was. In verse 2 from the Hebrew, when it says, Again she gave birth to his brother of all, there is argument on both sides of the equation. And I will tell you, I don't think anyone can dogmatically say which way. There are those who believe that Cain and Abel were twins. And there are those who believe that she had them separately. You know, that there was at least nine months in between. Okay? Just throwing it out there because you'll hear both things. The Hebrew basically says she continued to bear his brother. Mm -hmm. Now that's why it could be looked on as twins because you have one and then you continue to bear and give birth to your second twin. Um, we've got one in our audience who's got twins, so I know at least he knows what I'm speaking about. Double header, got two at once. <laughs> I guess there's two of you. Julie also, okay, and that was day for those who didn't know. Um, there are many around us with that example, but again, I'm not here to say which way it was, it's just curiosity. We'll find out when we get to have it. doesn't matter. We know that both were a gift from the Lord, whether it was together or nine months at least apart. But wouldn't they said because they said when, what was it, that had the twins? It was twins. She had twins and one was... Uh, that would be a good point. It's made very clear when Rebecca had twins. That's right. It was very clear. She had the battle going on in the womb and said to the Lord, what's going on? Oh, well, you got two nations inside of you fighting against each other. You know, you've got... I shouldn't. I was going to yeah. say Russia and Ukraine, but I shouldn't <laughs> say that because Ukraine did nothing to provoke. So, um, And I don't mean to go political here, but yeah, that's a good point to say. It is very clear there. It's not very clear here, so that would give us room to say probably not. We know whichever way, Kion is the elder. Um, and we know that, that, and I'll show this as we go on, that there's a whole lot more. Adam and Eve didn't just have two children and stop, folks. If they did, we got a whole lot of problem of where our human race came from. <laughs> and if you aren't thinking, start thinking. I'll clear that up in just a bit. So Michelle? let's look and see what... It does say here that she she said she brought forth a man, not two men. Oh, that's right. I'd have to look and see if it's that specific in the Hebrew, but it probably is um, because I have gotten a man child. So again, another reason to say it sounds very much like it's separate. Two separate births. Two separate births. Yeah. Two separate yeah. Verses. Right now, without looking at the other arguments on the other side, you're making a very convincing case. So. But we'll continue on because, again, she gave birth to his brother of all. She continued to bear, whichever way. Time in between or not, it doesn't matter. Again, we know that there were more than just these two, but these two are front and center stage. You know, if God told us everything, we wouldn't, get, we wouldn't even be able to get through it to begin with, let alone study it and learn from it. So he gives us an outline of what we need to know. We don't need to know everything else. We need to know everything that's in the Word of God. So, of all, Abel was a keeper of the flocks. He was a shepherd, sheep herder. Uh, of course, it could be more than sheep, but we'll just call it that to, you know, you know what flocks are. Kion was a tiller of the ground. Okay, by the way, I forgot to tell you the name of all, Abel, and this also would give room to say there was time between their births. It means vanity or vapor, okay? The idea that it makes me think of is when, I think it's Solomon, Shlomo, if it wasn't, it was his father, David, David, that spoke about the vapor of life. Yeah, I think it's Solomon, though. How, I know Solomon, vanity and vanity, all is vanity. Let me take you to Romans 8.20, regardless of which one said it in our original covenant. In Romans 8.20, here is the thought that that name is supposed to be provoking in uh, what was in Eve's mind when she named her second son of all. And he, in Romans 8 verse 20 it says, For the creation was subjected to futility, futility, sorry, vanity, um, to this, to being a vapor, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it 
And it goes on in hope because creation hopes to be relieved from the sin curse that's on it also. But it's speaking to that vanity, that vapor of life. Apparently by the time she has a ball, and I'm going to say that it's a little down the line, she's realizing that it's, it's not all over here, that it's not this short, that she's seeing probably nature around her, she's seeing death come in, because the curse is on, on nature now. Remember, Adam's having to till that ground, and it's hard work. It's thorns and thistles and weeds, and, and there is death being pictured. And so she's realizing the impact the curse of sin has had on this world. And she's realizing man is just like a vapor. He's not permanent in this body of flesh. She's starting to catch on to, it's not, you know, she must be aging. And she's seeing the age. This is something new. You know, Adam and Eve didn't watch each other grow up. They were formed as adults. But as they're seeing their children grow, that also speaks to the, the future, that they will also die. So she's seeing that, and I think that's what it's, it's reflective in his name, that life isn't permanent, not here on this earth. This flesh is now a vapor. It's now futile. It comes to an end. But of all, Abel also is going to be our picture of the spiritual man. Where Kion, we saw in 1 John, it's a picture of the evil, the seed of the evil one. Now let me show you why we say better of Abel, of all. Go with me to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, our great chapter of faith that has many giants to encourage us in it. In verse 4, early on it says, By faith of all offered to God a better sacrifice than Kion, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about, about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Abel's dead, but we're still hearing his voice today. He still speaks. What's he saying? As we go on, we're going to tell you what he's saying. But it shows you, do you see how God refers to him as a righteous man? So he's not um, the, of the evil seed like um, Kion. And we'll see that more as we study the difference between the two, what's given to us back in Genesis 4. On the way back to Genesis 4, Matthew 23 and verse 25, we read, <coughs> and it's the wrong verse. Okay, 35, sorry, Matthew 23, 35, where we read, So that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous of all to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berchiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So we're finding out in this verse, by the time Matthew's writing this, we don't just have righteous Abel who was slain. We've got a lot of righteous people who have had their blood shed. And it's not over yet. That number is still growing. Unfortunately, that number is growing today, and it will grow by leaps and bounds in the... Um, coming tribulation age also where so many will be martyred for their faith that it says that they can't even be numbered. Luke 11, 50 and 51, and then we'll go back to Genesis 4. Luke 11 and verse 50, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Aval to the blood of Zechariah, Again, where he was killed, and it goes on from there. So, again, we've got prophets whose blood has been shed, and that's just since the foundation of the world. That means we're going all the way back, and we know of all was that first generation. Of all was, to our knowledge, the second child of Adam and Eve. Very quickly on, and he's going to have his blood shed. Wow. Wow. And I think, and I do, get so sick of this world and the murder that's in this world and I think back to them I don't know how many more Adam and Eve had but in a small number and they're all family you already have murder I yeah sometimes I really wonder why God didn't just say I'll, I'll just wipe out all of humanity start again do something else I mean it's only his grace and his mercy and wanting to be able to show that grace and mercy and that love, that, that he didn't do something like that. 
I guess if he did, who's he going to be able to show it to? Anyway, back now to Aval being a keeper of the flocks, a keeper of the sheep probably in particular, because we're going to see that he brings a, a sheep sacrifice. Um, he, being a shepherd, would provide clothing for the family. That wool would, would be great clothing for them. Anna also would provide the sacrifice needed for Jehovah. And we'll see that there is this need as we go on. By occupation, he even represents the heavenly one because we know Yeshua is referred to as our shepherd, our great shepherd, the chief shepherd. And we know many analogies to the shepherd and their sheep in scripture. So again, of all in his line, we're going to see, well, I can't say his line because there isn't a line yet. Of all, we're going to see is the spiritual picture of spiritual man, Kion, the one of Satan. In that, he's a tiller of the ground. That means he was a farmer. That would provide food for the family. He <coughs> did not eat meat until after the flood. Genesis 9.3, if you want to look at that on your own, God says, where I've given you all the green herbs and all of that to eat, now everything is for you to eat. And that's when meat came into the diet of uh, humankind. But before that point, they did not eat any of the meat. So um, it's not that the occupation is bad. We need food. They needed food. They needed to be able to eat. But we're looking at an earthly versus a picture of the spiritual. And we'll follow that through as we continue on. Question? No. Okay. All right. So as we go on, I think we're ready for verse 3. We are verse 3. So it came about in the course of time that Kion brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Okay, before we get to the offering, let's look at that course of time, that process of time. The Hebrew actually refers to it in the end of days. That doesn't mean the end time days because we refer to the end of days coming and there's 6,000 years between Kion and that happening because we know man's almost 6,000 years old. So obviously the Hebrew is not referring to that total end, but it had to have an end in mind it might have been as short, but I doubt it. It could have been, well, in fact, no, it couldn't have been. But it could be short. It could have been like, we'll say, the end of the week. Okay, it could have been like a week. I do think that it meant a very short time. It may have been looking to a Sabbath day, a Shabbat. Because remember, God created the earth in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. That was the first Shabbat. And he did that, setting the example for mankind. So we know they had that day of rest in there. So it could have been as short as, as that, but I think there had to have been time for our story to develop, so I don't think it was that first Shabbat, but it could have been that, that they knew in this certain amount of time there was something coming, this end. Just like we'll look now, we've got the end of the year coming. Well, we don't because we're in April, <laughs> but you know what I mean. We'll talk in years, we'll talk in seasons. It's almost the end of, in our case, it's the beginning of spring. So that means that we've had the end of, end of winter. There was a course of time, an end that it's referring to. As we go on, I think we'll be more clear about what we're trying to say. So it came about in the course of time. Time has passed now that Kion, king, brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. What did he bring? He brought some of his own work. He brought what his sin-stained hands had been able to produce. But he brought what they were able to produce from an earth that is also cursed. So with sin-soaked hands, working in a sin-soaked earth, he brings something to the Lord. He brings the best, but it still was not perfect. Now, for some time, he must have, and why I think there has to be time in here, he must have brought an animal sacrifice before this time. The same that we're going to see that of all, Abel, had that. And it could even be that enough time has passed that they've grown up, and maybe there's a purchase. Cain, hmm, I need an animal to make the sacrifice to the Lord, my brother's got animals. I need one of his animals. Well, I can't just go say, give it to me, it's mine. <laughs> but hey, of all, would you like some fruit? 
I've got some delicious fruit. It's ripe in this season, and I'll pay you in fruit. You give me an animal. That very easily could have been what was going on. Now, I cannot tell you this is exactly how it took place, but something had been taking place. And we get hints that there have been sacrifices long before this one that, that uh, Cain is bringing to the Lord at this time. Where would they have learned to do that? They would have been instructed by their parents, Adam and Eve, who learned from the sacrifice that God made to clothe them that there needs to be a sacrifice. God had to been teaching them. Again, we don't have everything. We know that God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening before sin entered into the picture, and we have no clue what they talked about. I'd love to know. I'm just curious. What was God sharing with them? What was he telling them about? What was he teaching them? What was that like? To, to walk and talk and hear the voice of the very creator in, you know, in, like you're hearing my voice now. Wow, I mean, we could go on and on. There's so much in this beginning that you can let your mind wander and wan wander and wonder. <laughs> Just don't go off into building doctrines on it. Stay close to the scripture because we could get in trouble. But obviously, instruction by God, sacrifice system in place, and this time has come now where maybe Kion has started to resent that he has to be indebted to his younger brother, that he has to take from what his brother is raising. It's kind of the attitude of pride. Hey, I'm doing something good here. My fruit's good. Look at this beautiful fruit that I've developed. I nurtured it. I cultivated it. I worked with the ground to get it to, to come out. This is better than the last time around. We don't know, but it is presumed that in some way, Rebellion has started to enter into Kion's heart. And he's finally going to refuse. I'm not going to take a sheep. I'm going to bring my own fruit. I'm going to do it my way. If that's not rebellion against God, then I don't know what rebellion is. This, again, is why I think time's passed. Something's happened here for this to have time to develop. And by the time we get through these next verses, Kion is old enough that he has a wife. So we're not talking little eight-year-olds. We're talking adults. We're talking that time has passed. That's also why I think it was far more than a Shabbat, but in a time that God had set for the course of what was happening is when this story takes place. So we're going to see that Kion and Aval have grown to manhood. We're going to see that Adam and Chava have already had daughters. Because where else did Kion get his wife? And he didn't marry Eve. Okay, follow the story and find out that Kion and his wife are going to go off. Eve doesn't go off. Okay, so obviously there were more children. Um, I won't even begin to tell you how many children in our Jewish tradition it said that they had because it's all surmised, so I'm not even going to go there. But let me point out to the fact, because I think most of you know the story, when we have Seth being born to Adam and Chava, does anyone know how old Adam is? Which tells us how old Eve was when she gave birth. And I'll give you a little hint. As far as I know, she's the oldest mama giving birth on record. <laughs> so if you remember one who was quite old in scripture, who miraculously gave birth, and if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'll tip my hand and say Yitzhak, Isaac, the child of miraculous birth to Sarah, who was of advanced age, way, way past childbearing years. Well, you got to go past Sarah's age. You got to go past Sarah at 90 and Abraham at 100. You've got to go past. Anyone know? Anyone remember? It's right there in scripture for us, but it's ahead of us. I will tell you. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Adam and Eve were 130 years old when Seth is born to them. Now, in our little finite mind, how many of you are going, wow, I never thought about that. I had them young and having children like we do today in our 20s and our 30s. You know, we're not even thinking. But to prove my point, read on your own chapter 5, verse 3, and it will tell you that when Seth was born to Adam, Adam, Adam and Chava, after Aval's death, 
that he was 130 years old. And how do I know that Eve was 130 years old? They were created at the same time. Remember, there wasn't a long time in between. So if Adam's 130, Eve's lived 130 years. Okay? So by chapter 5 and verse 3, we've had time for children. We've had time for grandchildren. We've had time for great-grandchildren by now. There's plenty of room in that amount of time. So we've got a, a little family here going. We've got more than, we're not just looking at four people on the face of these, the earth. We're looking at it has grown. Now, what's our problem here? Kayan is not acknowledging that he is a sinner in need of a blood sacrifice. He is seeking to come to God on his own terms, on his own way, on the grounds of personal worthiness. Does that sound very familiar? Is that true to humankind today? How many people do we know who have not come into the blood of the Lamb called Yeshua who are saying, well, I'm a good person. Why wouldn't God let me into heaven? I've done good deeds all my life. I'm worthy. That's what they're saying. But anyway, apart from the shed blood of the Lamb, is out. It does not work. Because God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sin. So taking pride in your own works can make you a great religious person, but it makes you a very natural person. The, that, that natural side, that sin side is what I'm trying to say. Remember the, the earthly, the earthly side versus the spiritual. Okay, so... We see Kion doesn't just have a little problem. We, we're seeing a real hard attitude here that we've got a problem with. And we'll show, we'll, I will show you as I go on that the Hebrew clearly brings that out. Now, some today, when they talk about people wanting to do it their own way, will use an expression called the way of Cain, the way of Kion. And they get that from a little book called Jude, all the way almost to the very end, just before Revelation. Jude is only one chapter long, so I'm going to tell you to look at verse 11. But if you happen to be on a tablet, you still have to put in chapter 1, verse 11 to get it. Otherwise, you won't get it. Jude, verse 11 says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Kion, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Without going into lessons on Balaam and Korah, Balaam showed... Um, how to cause the children of Israel to stumble was in idolatry and sexual immorality. In fact, it was more than sexual immorality even. And the rebellion of Korah was when he came against God's anointed Moshe and Aharon, Moses, and Aaron, and said, hey, it's all in your family. Who appointed you those positions? I think I should be the priest. And God said, really? I think you, you should go... Your whole body, your whole family, everything should go right now down into the heart of the earth. That means into Sheol, into the suffering side. The earth opened up and swallowed up Korah in the rebellion. God didn't take it lightly when someone came up against him and said, it should be my way. Mm -hmm. So the way of Kion, Jude 11, this is not a good way to be. It denies that they are sinners separated from God's presence and that the only way to access into God's presence is through a blood sacrifice. So many people say, I don't like that. I don't like blood. I don't like to think somebody had to die. I'm going to push that aside and I'm going to find a way myself. And again, everything falls short. Everything. We can't do anything in our humanness. Kayan brought the best of his hands and the best of the land. His hands were sin, <coughs> sinful. The earth was sinful. It wasn't a perfect earth. It wasn't perfect hands. It wasn't perfect what was brought before the Lord. And it wasn't what God said. I gave you earlier Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sin. Vi, uh, okay. Vayikra. I have to think to say it right. Vayikra is Leviticus. Leviticus 17.11. And I quote this so many times to you, but this is critical. Um, especially to show our Jewish people that this is the only way 
and God put it right there in our Torah for our instruction. 1711 of Leviticus says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. If they had read that, they wouldn't have... Leviticus 1711. Yeah. If they had read this and knew this, they would not have bled George Washington to death. They leached his blood out of him because they thought he had blood poisoning and they thought, get rid of the blood and he can heal up. But they took too much blood out and he ended up dying. The life of the flesh is in the blood. God speaking, I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood, by reason of the life, that makes atonement. There has to be a life involved. Something has to give its life for that life to come to the other. And thankfully, the one who gave his life for us, that Lamb of God, was able, because of being fully God as well as fully man, to live perfectly, shed perfect blood, and then raise from the dead, conquer it all the way. Didn't even just take care of the, the penalty, but conquered it. The penalty, the wages of sin is death. But he conquered it. He tore it down. He shredded it. He stepped on it. Whatever you want to say, he came alive. And because of that, we can come into that life. But only through that shed blood, no matter what. They want to declare that human nature is essentially good. And I say, really? Did you listen to the news? Human nature is not essentially good. Look at little ones. You don't teach little ones to, I mean, yes, you can as they grow to be more evil or to be more, you know, good. But when they're real little, before they've been able to impress or be impressed by us, they're showing that nature. They're showing it's all about me. Wow. <laughs> they're showing tempers and they're showing all kinds of I remember my my nephew he, I think he was 18 months old when he had to get stitches bless his heart not his mommy's fault <laughs> but things happen and they they summed up in the time of waiting in the emergency room it really would be best for this mama to not watch her son get the stitches put in so he was asleep by this point because of the exhaustion and because of what they'd given him to calm him down and they told mama we promise you he won't know that you're not there he will not remember this you're not forsaking your son but you need to go and we need to take care of your son so they did and very soon here comes a nurse bringing back Ryan and his mom in, in her arms to give him back to his mommy and she's got a smile on her face and she's chuckling and she says to him, to her his mommy this one has a temper <laughs> when he woke up he didn't mind at all that we were doing the stitches he didn't like the fact he found his arms and his legs tied down. He was bound so that he wouldn't move. And he had a fit over being tied down. <laughs> now, that was the best thing in the world for him. No one was being mean to him. But he showed he had a little temper. And he was very young. It wasn't something that his parents had taught him to be. It was what he was born with. Very strong will. That can be good and that can be bad. But we see, you know, I just I want to make it very clear that human nature is not good at the core. It just isn't. We're born with a rebellious nature we're born with that sin we no matter how good we want to be and try to live a good life we're still not on that perfect level of god and we can only come the way that he said and that's what evolved did. he came the way god said you have to come what'd you say patty i said selfish and self-centered selfish and self-centered me 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 it is it is again babies don't mean to be self-centered but they are they want all of their mama's attention. They want to be fed when they want to be fed. They want to sleep when they want to sleep. I mean, we learn to adapt to their schedule. They don't get on our schedule for a while. <laughs> and again, it's not anything that you can say I fault them for. It's just, it's just human nature. It's just what we're born with. I could go on and on about proving the human nature from the beginning, but I don't think I need to because you know what? We all can relate. We, <laughs> we all can go back. We all have had babies. We've, We've all had babies <laughs> or been around babies yep. <laughs> or seen it mm -hmm. and know what I'm speaking about. So, again in verse 
3, it says that Kayan brought an offering to the Lord. Now, the way that it's being phrased, and again, we're looking at the Hebrew to get our full meaning, no, but we're no. getting the idea... <laughs> I've got a, a kitty cat that's not perfect either who just went where he doesn't go, belong. Go, go. Are you going to get down or do I have to come get you? <laughs> See, even kitties have their own wills. <laughs> he knows he doesn't belong on the table. <laughs> and I love him to death, but he's not perfect. <laughs> and he wasn't perfect when he teased his sister earlier <laughs> either. Okay, back on track. The Hebrew tells us... <clears throat> There seems to be an indication, let me put it that way, that there was a particular place to bring the offerings. Okay? Now, we're not reading in Scripture, thou shalt bring it to this place. But, notice with me, just real quick, jump down to verse 16. In verse 16, Cain Kayan went out from the presence of the Lord. So there's a place where the Lord and he were having a tete-a-tete, -tete, and he goes out from the presence of the Lord, and he's going to settle elsewhere. So we get the idea that the presence of the Lord dwelt somewhere. There was a place where he communed with them. Now that's not a foreign thought if you go back to the garden. Go back to the garden and God met Adam and Eve, walked with him in the cool of the evening. He, they walked and they talked together. When it was coming toward evening on the day that they had, had eaten the fruit, they knew to hide because God was going to come. His presence came and he dwelt with them and he talked with them. So apparently there was a place where the presence of the Lord was where they would bring an offering. Okay, it just, it, it really sounds like it has to be. This place where they would bring their offering is how God could have communication with them again because they're coming through the shed blood. They're coming through that example. It seems very likely wherever this presence of the Lord was, where he's going to have his conversation with Kion, would have been an altar there because you had an altar to give a sacrifice. We're going to read in verse 4, we can look at it real quickly, we're going to read with Aval when he brings his sacrifice, um, where is it, on his part, okay. Okay, I guess it's not in verse 4. Well, yes, it is. It's, it's surmised again. He brought the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. He gives the fat to the Lord. He gives the offering to the Lord. When we see that a little further down in the Torah, in the law, when they're told sacrifices there to bring, it, it spells it out real clearly. We're here, we're just given that, that sketchy outline. But how do you give the fat to the Lord if it's not a sacrifice? You know, I mean, obviously... He didn't cut fat off of the sheep and say, here's a blob of fat, Lord. So it had to have been in the sacrifice. And, and if you read through the sacrifices, you'll understand more what I'm meaning. So again, there must be an altar. This would be a likely place for the Lord to communicate with his people because they're coming to what I will call for us today the foot of the cross. They're coming to the place where they're going to apply the blood on this altar as God has taught them to do to cover their sins at this point because all animal blood could do is cover. The better blood, Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 9, 10, 8, 9, 10, goes through a lot of this in, in symbolism, tells that the better blood by the better high priest on the better altar, the better sacrifice, the better, 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 better. That's why our key word for Hebrews is better, and it's all speaking about Yeshua, which this is a picture of, Yeshua, Jesus. So. When we think that, that there's a place where there was an altar, there was a place where they communicated with the Lord, where the presence of the Lord dwelt. And those of you who have been with me in the parashas, that phrase alone should put you right now in the tabernacle because that's where our people knew this was where the presence of the Lord was, the Holy of Holies. They saw the, the smoke form that told them that the presence of the Lord was there. So it's not a strange thought, it's just in its seedling form in Genesis being expounded on in, in Exodus and, and Leviticus and on as we go down through. So, where would it be? And I hinted at this a little earlier when we started our study. Where would be a likely place if we know, and I'm not telling you I dogmatically know, but I think we got a hint of it. Remember last week, and I see the puzzles, I don't see anybody wanting to volunteer. So let me say, let me take you to last week's lesson also. You remember when we studied the cherry beam? And what were the cherry beam always around? 
the glory of the Lord. Remember, they were vindicating the holiness of the Lord, vindicating the, the glory of the Lord. Um, they, we saw them around the throne in heaven. We saw them on the mercy seat. It's the cherubim wings that, that spread over together. And in that middle, it was the, where the presence of the Lord would dwell. That's where the blood was placed. We saw that the cherubim seemed to always have to do with the holiness of God. Okay, and if you've noticed, the mercy seat's there. Now they're bringing an offering. So would not there be an altar likely, possibly, near the presence of the cherubim? Where mm -hmm. it? Hmm? By the gate. By the gate. You're both saying it at the same time. <laughs> I've got Dora and Rowena in stereo, and I love it. <laughs> you got right where I got at the gate. The gate where they were thrust out of the Garden of Eden, where it was keeping them from the tree of life so they wouldn't live in their sinful state. But is it almost, we could look at it and say that as they would bring that altar, I mean, bring that sacrifice to the altar, knowing God's presence was still meeting them through that sacrifice and foreshadowing that way to the tree of life, I'm going to be your way to the tree of life because I am the gate. I am the way. And we know in the tabernacle, he is the way. That there are three gates, in essence, that they go through. And you see it, and symbolically, you see it, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And the whole tabernacle is in the shape of the cross. They have to come in through the way. Then they, and the way is through Yeshua Jesus. He is the truth. The truth leads them into the holy of place. When we come into the truth, the truth sets us free. And when we go through that veil into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God, I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that life is our abundant life that we have through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus that takes us into heaven, into his very presence, where we will live forever and see those cherubim circling his throne, even moving with him, with his throne. So... To me, it's, it's a, almost a picture, like the tabernacle was foreshadowing. This place at the gate was just a little taste for them. I've made the way. There's a way back into the tree of life. There's a way to have that abundant life. It's through the truth. Oh, I am the truth. Not, not he's saying, oh, I get it. I'm saying we get it. I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. This is what I think we're seeing that these cherry beam guarding against their way into the tree of life would at the same time be showing them you are going to be able to come into the holiness of God and into eternal life with him. How? Bring your sacrifice. Bring the blood. Place it here. One day, God on his mercy seat will place the blood of the Lamb of God and open the way to his home forever. Is that not a beautiful picture? I love it. I hope you do, because it just so encourages me that he planned it from the beginning and he wants that for us. Because I, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of the horrors, the murders. We just had what happened in the subway. We've got what's going on in, in uh, Russia, in, in Ukraine. We've got what Israel's dealing with continually. Do you know Israel has had so much internal now that they have told all their people who have rights to guns, who when they're in the service, they're married to their Uzi and it goes with them everywhere they go, literally. It goes everywhere. But they have told their people, if you have a gun, you have your permit for your gun, you've been trained now to use that gun, you're to have that on your person 24 seven right now because we don't know where the enemy lurks. So if you're in your garden and you're gardening, you've got something right there to protect you and your family. Because right now, those who look like neighbors are the enemy infiltrating. And that's why you're having so many stabbings and shootings and things happening right now. And that has to do every year when Passat comes, when Passover comes, when Ramadan comes, Ramadan is inciting them to kill the infidel, which is the Jew and the Christian. Passover, they want to catch the world's attention, destroy the family get-togethers. It's just, it's, it's their nature. But I'm so sick of it. 
I wonder how God tolerates it because I only know a snapshot and he sees it all and he hears the cries of his righteous who have their blood shed innocently, who are under that throne in Revelation saying, how long before you avenge our blood? And he says, just, just a little while longer, your number isn't complete, but when it is, oh yes, I will avenge your blood all the way from righteous of all to at that time Zechariah, but all the way to those martyred even in the tribulation period just before his return and second coming. But I think it's beautiful that in the midst of that evil, we can keep our eyes on the holiness of the Lord and on his preservation, his way, and know this is just the short, folks. This is the drop in the bucket. Eternity, <laughs> this is just a, a, not even a blip on the radar. So be encouraged, be strengthened. Um, realize also the Shekhinah glory of God often seen between the cherry beam. Here we do see, um, it's in the Hebrew, but it gives the idea that the Shekhinah, that glory that was seen, um, I think it was described in 324. Let me look at it, see if I've got the right reference for you. Chapter 3. Okay, they are taking it from chapter 3 and verse 24. The flaming sword they, there, they're saying that there was in that, the Shekhinah is in that flaming sword. In other words, how is it flaming? It's flaming by the glory of the Lord. Now, that's hard for us to see because we think of the sword as kill. But think about the sword that comes out of the mouth of the Lord when he comes in second coming to annihilate the enemies of those who have come against his people, who have come against Israel, who are wanting to annihilate, and the Lord's putting a stop to it. <coughs> so that the, it says that even for the elect's sake, the believers who, who come to faith, even for their sake, those days are cut short. So I think in the Hebrew, the idea is there, even in that fiery sword, that God's presence is there. We just have to look at it as the sword that's pure and right and just and fair, the sword that stops the evil that is bad. Um, um, I think I've given it to you all. It, it does say in the Hebrew when they were, when the, the cherry beam were placed or were stationed, the, that same word is given the, the English word dwell it's used 83 times in the Old Testament, and I, I forget, I, I, maybe it's 83 times, it's used more than that, but 83 of the times they translate it dwell, where right now we're saying the angels were placed or the angels were stationed here, the idea is dwelling. And again, if we've got a picture of Shekhinah glory and a dwelling, and we know that's what the altar, the mercy seat in the tabernacle, the, what we see in the heavenly, I think that we're seeing that, yes, it's quite likely that even though God had to kick them out of the Garden of Eden and they couldn't have the pleasures of that, he still was showing them the same way he did when he gave them that prophecy first, that the seed of the woman would conquer their enemy. Here he's saying, your enemy will be conquered. Under the blood, you'll be redeemed. I think that's what we're getting a whole picture of here. So it almost would be a, a mercy seat. I say almost because it wasn't patterned after the one in heaven that we get in the tabernacle. But I'm going to say it's, a, it's a, um, an outdoor. Because <laughs> it's out in the garden, uh, right outside of the garden, I mean. But it's an outdoor mercy seat. Then we see a mercy seat develop into a spe specific, uh, 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 is that the right word? You know, it has a shape that was patterned after the heavenly. I'm not saying this one was an exact shape, but it's the foreshadowing of it. So, do you all follow? Am I making it clear or am I confusing? Confusing? Confusing. Okay, we know the mercy seat in the tabernacle is a picture of the heavenly one. I'm saying this is like it foreshadowed that mercy seat. God was showing his mercy at the altar before there was a mercy seat that is pictured in the tabernacle. Okay, that did it. That The light went on, and we know that there's one in heaven. I cannot imagine what the heavenly must look like. Wow.
Wow, I, I often just think, what does heaven look like? <clears throat> Those of you who think heaven's gold streets, <laughs> well, that might be one part, uh, one view, but do you realize there's a whole tabernacle up there? <clears throat> there is so much more than just gold to walk on. I mean, that's just the beginning. <laughs> Widen your horizons, folks. There's a lot more up there. Um, but again, um, we'll regain access to the tree life in heaven. Here, I think it's foreshadowing it. I think it's a picture of it. So, yes. And the rainbow. Around the throne. Yep. And rainbow speaks of his up. promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Don't miss the rainbow ever. <laughs> okay. Any questions, comments? <coughs> I hope it blesses you. I've spent a little time here because to me to see, you know, God made man to dwell with man. When we went through his creation, I brought that out many a times, and you see it so much in the Hebrew, all the, the different ways that it's referred to in the different levels and all that is in there, that God <coughs> made man because he wanted intimate relationship with man. He had the angels. He had who knows what else he's created. He had everything. But yet he went to all the trouble of creating man for a reason, and it's that intimacy. And that's what, you know, the, those Hebrew pictures of how he made the house to bring man into the house to, to have fellowship with him, all of that is so rich, and we see it. I mean, we're only in the fourth chapter. How many times have I seen it already and said it and brought it out? And that just amazes me, this holy God, and I mean H-O-L-Y. Kadosh, the holy God that wants a relationship with who he created, that he formed you. Granted, we see he formed Adam, and he didn't come down and form each one of us in that same way, but he did in the sense that, that we're humankind. He forms each one of us. We know that David says he knit us in his mother's womb. That, you know, he says, before I was, you knit me in my mother's womb. You knew my days before I was ever formed. That intimacy, that love, that attention, that is so precious to me that God loved us so. You need to feel loved today? Just wallow in that for a little while. Or a better word, bask in it. Yes, Maria, unmute yourself. What is interesting, and you were saying it, it's um, very hard for us to understand, even because we are so accustomed to this world, this world of, of uh, ugliness and, right. and fear and uncertainty, right. that is very difficult for us to wrap our mind to a place where there's going to be uh, love, forgiveness, the, right. everything, and the peace. Right. You know, that we will not, we will not remember what fear was. Right, right, right. Because the perfect me, love me. casts out fear. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think I wore the right shirt today without knowing it. If you can't read it, because it's too small, <laughs> yeah. it says Yeshua loves you. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and yes, you know, th that's exactly what I'm trying to say. And that's unconditional love. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He didn't love us because we found a way to bring something good. And we're going to see that when, when he deals with Cain. And I want to get back there. We're going to see that it wasn't that he didn't love Cain. Excuse me. In fact, his great love for Cain, he strove with Cain. He tried to bring him in because he wanted that with him. And really, no one is separated from the love of God because of God. They're separated from the love of God because they choose that for themselves to, to go against yeah. this one who's done everything for them. Finally got my tablet to work. I'm back to chapter 4. Time is going. Let's get a little further because I'd like us to get some complete thoughts. So, we have that place. We have a special place. We have the place where uh, sacrifice apparently was brought. Again, we've got adult children here. We're not talking little ones. Um, we're talking long enough, you know, many years that there's um, all of these generations already started. 
but yet we're studying the two who were the first two and, and what they were led to do and learning from them. We see for, we know what Cain did. What did Aval do? What did his brother do? Abel on his part also brought, verse 4, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. Okay, so we know that the sheep is a type of the Lamb of God, a picture of the Lamb of God. We know that from the very beginning, from Genesis 3.15, from the time of Pesach, um, Exodus 12, you have, uh, well, first in Genesis, you have a lamb for a man. In Exodus, you have a lamb for a family, and you have the lamb for the nation, because even though they, as a family, each one had to take a lamb and had to put the blood on the doorpost of the lamb, they also, when you read it, you read about the nation was to bring the lamb singular and it was killed for the nation singular and that again is a picture of messiah a picture of the one who would be the lamb of god who would take away the sin of the world that's why that that verse that i say over and over and over that you all should have memorized too yochanan john 129 when he saw when he was bringing people to know they needed to repent before god he sees yeshua coming ready to to be fulfilling his ministry who John knew his, his, this ministry was going to be the greater and you have him say behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin not of one not of a family but of the world going all the way back and all the way future because we're of the world today but Cain and Abel were of the world then and when we get into past us whoever it is they're going to be of the world so we know the sheep is definitely a type of Messiah, the Lamb of God. God gave instructions. Hebrews 11 told us that. We saw that real quickly. Let me go back there, except for the fact I'm having trouble with my tablet. Same way it did this before, where I don't know what it's doing. Or actually, I know what it's not doing, and that's cooperating. Okay. By faith, Hebrews 11.4, Abel offered to God a better, better sacrifice than Kion, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, okay? So obviously God had given instruction. God didn't just say, bring me a sacrifice. God didn't say, do what you will, do what you want, think of something, create something, you know, let's see what you can come up with. No, he gave instruction. They were to do something specific, and Aval showed his faith in God by following, being obedient to those instructions. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. You have to hear it, and then you have to be obedient to it. Faith comes by hearing is Romans 10, 17. So of all, hearing the word of the Lord, being obedient to the word of the Lord, in Genesis 4, we see that he brought on his part the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. Okay, now that, that what he's bringing in its best, the best out of the flock, not weak, not sickly, not with blemish, would show us the excellency, the purity, the perfectness of Messiah. We're in Genesis 5? We're back in Genesis 4. Oh, 4. Okay. Yeah, Genesis well, where 4. where did you say the instructions come from? Oh, um, well, from the Word of God. We know that God instructed Cain and Abel. We know that God showed the sacrifice in Genesis 3.15. But we know that he gave instruction because we know that Abel gave, it says that, that um, how does it say it? Um, Okay, the Lord, have, maybe I haven't read it yet. Um, I know what I want. I'm trying to find it fast. Is it the word firstlings? Does that no. mean special? Uh, tell me, firstlings means in a minute, but it says, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. I haven't oh. read it yet. That was my problem. Sorry, folks. That's the end of verse 4. How did they know? Obviously, God had taught them. Abel obeyed God, and so he had respect for what Abel brought. He had regard for what Abel brought. He did not respect or have regard for what Kion brought, because Kion said, ah, I'm doing it my own way. I've got my own here. Okay, so obviously God had told them. He didn't just leave it up to them for chance. Firstlings would be the like the first fruits, the first of the, the best that, that's come, and by it being a good, uh, how did it put it, um, the fat and all of that, it just shows very healthy, very good. It's showing the fullness of the life of Messiah, that he was holy, he was good, he was pure, that he gave his, his best, his all to God in giving his life, 
his human life and that this is what the sacrifice was to show. That's why right from the start we know they, they were not allowed to give sickly or blemished because this was not the right picture. The Lord was not sickly. He wasn't blemished. He wasn't saying, well, this one's not worth much. Give it. No, the one that, that's worth it all, your first ones, your, your prime ones, your prize ones, this is what you're to give from because God gave his prize. He gave his all to show us, to bring us, and to bring us in. It is interesting that the fat already was been given to the Lord here. And when we go into the Levitical offerings, let me show you. Let's go real quick just so you know I can back up what I'm saying. Leviticus chapter 3. And in Leviticus chapter 3, we're going to look at several verses. The first one will be 16. Leviticus 3 and verse 16. Don't think I'm going to get quite as far as I want, so I may summarize some thoughts and come back and prove them next week. Leviticus 3, verse 16, The priest shall offer them up in smoke on the altar as food, an offering by fire for a soothing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. Okay, chapter 7 and verse 23. Chapter 7, verse 23. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall not eat any fat from an ox, a sheep, or a goat. I think we're getting an idea here. <laughs> it's very clear. Verse 25, Whoever eats the fat of the animal from which an offering by fire is offered to the Lord, a sacrifice, even the person who eats shall be cut off from his people. That's huge. You're going to be cut off from Israel. You're going to be out of the promise. You're going to be out of the blessings if you eat the fat from any of these animals. God said the fat belonged to him. The way that the blood represents life, the fat also is representing life apparently, and they were forbidden to eat it. Under law, man is not entitled to life. The law did not bring life to anyone. They couldn't keep the law. They weren't free from the law. They were under the condemnation of the law. So the law is condemning them because they can't live up to the demands of the law. They have to live it perfectly. They have to follow every commandment perfectly. They have to keep every one because the scripture tells us if you break one, you've broken it all. So it's, it's not that they can, well, I kept 600 but I didn't keep the others. No, it doesn't matter. If you break one, you've broken them all. And so the law was to, to show them they can't make it. They can't pull a king. They can't pull a, I can figure out myself. I can bring my best. I'm a good person. I do good deeds. Here's what I can bring to the Lord. Yes, Rhonda. Unmute yourself. Okay. When, um, that scripture that says if you break any part of the law, you break all of it? Mm -hmm. Isn't that scripture a New Testament scripture? It's also in Deuteronomy. Let me see if oh, I can, is it? Yeah. Let me see if I can find it fast. Almost all of what you see like that in the new is based out of the original, which you call the old. Whoops. Um, okay. Break one. I, I can almost pull it. Oh. Break one. I may have to come back because I'm fighting the clock right now. But, okay. and, I, and I knew, as soon as it was out of my mouth, I knew I was going to be in trouble. <laughs> I may okay. have it. it okay, James 2.10 is what you're referring to, um, but I know it's Deuteronomy. Um, okay, let me do, let me do the right. research, and I'll, I'll put it on the end of this video teaching also. I'll, I'll addendum it so that it can be there, because um, it's just not coming back to mind. But I believe fully, I think it's Deuteronomy. So I'll bring it out to you. I will show you. Um, because I don't want to say anything that I can't. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I was looking to see if I had it anywhere in my notes. No, I've, I've gone off. So, okay. So I'll, I'll, That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'll get it back, though. I don't like not being able to back up. That bothers me. But either the Lord will bring it back to mind or I'll get it to you. Uh, I won't make you wait. Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27. Let's try it. It could be. Do you have a verse? Uh, 26. Okay. Deuteronomy 27. And 27, 26. Uh, yeah, that could be a curse to see who does not confirm the words of the law 
of this lot by doing them. I think it says it a little more specifically, though, unless I'm remembering wrong. Um, I, th I think there's something more specific, but that's a good start. That, that you have to confirm the words of the law by doing them. You have to keep the whole law. But like I say, I think in my mind, I'm remembering a verse that, that tells us, um, oh, that's going to bug the daylights out of me. Lord, bring it back to remembrance, please. Let me go on and let my mind work, because okay. sometimes that yeah. does pop it back up. Okay. Um, and I want to finish up the thoughts that I want to get here. But very good question, very important. Um, so we're seeing in the picture of the sacrifice that the blood and the fat are representing life. That under the Mosaic economy, when they have the law, they're forbidden to eat it. Also, even as here, all the fat was given to the Lord. So again, showing that, that life is precious, the life is given unto the Lord. Um, all that I've said, under grace, we have more freedom under that grace. We drink the wine, the juice, you know, it's a symbol of the blood. We eat the bread, the unleavened bread the matzah, as a symbol of his body. So we do get to partake of in grace, but that's because Messiah has paid the price, and Messiah has entitled us to this life, because he is the bread of life. We have to eat from him. That's what he calls himself in Yochanan in John 6. Let me back that one up and show you. John 6, many verses in John 6, and a lot of these, if you do Passover with me in a week, you'll get all of this brought back to you again. Right now, I'm going to just take you down to verse 51 to do it quickly, um, where it's summarized. And Yeshua, Jesus is speaking, and he says, I am those great words that connected all the Jewish people to that burning bush with Moshe. To when, when the people ask me, who do I say he sent me? You tell them I am. It's, it's the one who always existed, the one who is beyond past, present, future, the one who is who was, who is becoming, how, how that all works, we can't get it in our English. But then he completes it at this time with, I am the living bread that came, came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. There's your life. The bread which I also give, which, and the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So he gave his flesh that we might eat from him and have that life. He met the demands of the law for us. We never do meet those demands. He meets them for us. In Him, we're considered having fulfilled the law. So apart from Him, we're condemned by the law. In Him, we fulfill the law. Not that we ever get there. It's in Him. He did it. We get to be part of Him. We partake of Him. We eat His body and we drink His blood, and I do not mean that literally as some religions take it, but symbolically. When you go through Pesach, when you see your roots of communion from the Passover Seder, which is where that came from, you will see the symbolism of what Yeshua Jesus was talking about, and it comes out in so much depth. Wow, there's some real wow moments. If you're a first-timer, don't miss it. I love it, because it gets exciting. Okay, but back on track to finish up here. We want to see that two sacrifices have come before the Lord now. One was the fruit of his labor, of his hands, of the ground. One was the, the firstlings, the best of the flock that was brought, that also obviously there was shed blood. And how did the Lord feel about these two? Well, we see, as I said at the end of verse 4, the Lord had regard for of all and for his offering. We don't read that about kinds, about kings. The Lord did not have regard or respect. Of all's, Abel bringing a blood sacrifice in accordance with what God had demanded because he was saying, I'm a sinner. I need the saving work of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Of all, in following those steps, God is pleased with. He has regard for that sacrifice. It was on the basis of the offering. You don't read anywhere that God says on the basis of Abel or on the basis of Cain. It was on the basis of the offering, not the works of the person, not the person themselves. That's not what mattered. God didn't say, I like, Cain, I like Abel and I don't like Cain. No, God said it's on the basis of the offering. Abel brought the right offering. 
Kayan did not. I accept Abel's offering. I don't accept Cain's offering. I haven't heard, it's running in my mind this morning, I heard someone talking, a pastor talking about uh, Passover. And remember on the 10th of Nisan, they would take the lamb and they would keep it to the 14th day and inspect it during that time to make sure there was no blemish. Who's on trial for being as perfect as they could be? Was the lamb, not the man. They watched the lamb. When the, they went to the temple to offer the sacrifice, the priest did not come and look over the man and say, hmm, you've got a spot on your robe here and your hair is a little messed up and you, you didn't shave quite right today. He, the man wasn't ex inspected. The sacrifice, the lamb that the man brought would be inspected by the priest, that it had to pass muster, so to speak. It's the offering that God was saying he had respect for or he did not have respect for. It was not the person. It's the offering that's being accepted. It's not the person on trial. The person, it's imputed, their, their sins are imputed to the animal. It's the animal that's on trial. It's the Lord when he became the sacrifice for us that he was <clears throat> on trial. And you can take that and follow that in your mind right now. That's where it was at. And of course, he was perfect. He was worthy. He was blood being shed. Everything that God said it had to be. The unblemished sacrifice lamb. Hmm? The unblemished sacrifice lamb. The unblemished sacrifice lamb. Yes, said it all. <laughs> so, obviously, one's accepted and one was not. Now, because I've run out of time, let me just give one final thought, then I'm going to tie up a couple thoughts for you, but we'll come back and we'll look at them in all the verses in two weeks when we come back. Because for those who are watching on video, we are having class on April 13th. We will not next week, April 20th, but we'll be back on April 27th. God must have shown some way that the sacrifice was acceptable and the other sacrifice was not. It is a thought, it's not that I can say it dogmatically, but it's a thought that perhaps a vol's sacrifice was met with fire from heaven that burned up the sacrifice and showed this was accepted. Kayan's was not. Fire did not come from heaven. The sacrifice was not accepted. Let me show you fire coming from heaven showing that real quickly. Leviticus 9, and if you can't turn fast, just listen and I'll read it for you. Leviticus 9, verses 23 and 24. Here we go. Okay. Verses 23 and 24 says, Moshe and Aharon, Moses and Aaron, went into the tent of the meeting. That's the, the tabernacle, the name given to it, where they met with the glory of the Lord. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. So Moses and Aaron, in essence, went into the holy place. They had, were in the presence of the Lord. They were blessed by the Lord. They came out of the glory of the Lord, appeared to the people. And when that happened, then fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. Does this sound like of all's offer? The offering and the fat. And when all the people saw it, they shouted. I'm sure they shouted, hallelujah. But then notice what else they did. They fell on their faces. They knew they were in the presence of a holy God. I think that's what we're going to do the split second we get to heaven. We're going to shout out hallelujah and we're going to fall on our face. And then we're going to pick ourselves up and shout hallelujah again and we're going to fall on our face honoring our God again. And I think that's going to go on for the first, you know, thousand years or so while we get over the excitement, which we'll never get over. <laughs> yes. But that's just for, for the land. What happens because people could bring a pigeon or, or a bird or whatever. There were times that there were substitutions that were allowed to give for the sake, like for the poor, if they couldn't afford a lamb, they were allowed to bring the, the turtle doves. And each one still, through their sacrifice, blood was shed. Even with the birds, the blood was shed. But did so, they have to be, I mean, perfect and quite late? I'm sure they had to be as, as unblemished as possible, yes, yes, that once again you couldn't bring a winged bird, you couldn't bring a sickly bird, it had to be a healthy, had to be, you know, as close to perfect as could be. But God <coughs> made room because it was the picture, you know, of the perfect Lamb of God, but, uh, and there were times when there were other things that were to be sacrificed, um, but again, you, 
it was a sacrifice given to the Lord and there was blood that was shed. Okay, I'm not going to read them all now because there isn't time, but for those who do not have the cross references, fire coming down out of heaven is also in Judges chapter 6 and verse 21, 1 Kings 18 verse 38, and any who I do this too fast for and can't rewind or something, text me, get a hold of me, I'll get them to you. 1 Chronicles 21 verse 26, and 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 1. Some of those you might recognize, especially 1 Kings, you might remember the story behind it. I love that story. Uh, the others might not be quite as familiar, but God showed his approval, I believe, to of all sacrifice. I tend to think it was fire that came out from heaven and and uh, burnt up the sacrifice and showed. Kion, his was not acceptable. Maybe I don't need to give you any more thought. Maybe I can leave it right there. I, I don't want to... Um, let me just remind you, and I'll bring this back when we come back. We've got Cain showing us the earthly man. We've got Aval showing us the spiritual man. The spiritual man is, is in obedience to the Lord and that right relationship and the sacrifice has been accepted. The earthly, again, is working it on his own, doing his own way. We're going to see a rebellious heart. When we get down to verse um, 8, we see that Kion is going to kill his brother. Uh, I'll, I'll cliffhang this one for you, and I'll tell you there may not be a definite answer, but I'll give you some hints. Was it premeditated, or was it a sudden act of uh, extreme hatred? Good question. Does it matter? No. <laughs> I just want you to want to come back to class. <laughs> but we will see as we look at the Hebrew that it was a matter of Kion's heart. His heart was not right before God. And that's what's going to be revealed very clearly. I've already started it telling you, he's already rebelling, saying, I'll do it my way. I'm going to bring what I want, but we're going to see it continually as Kion goes down these steps. And I'll bring you out one more question. I'm going to have to write these down so I remember to answer them for you the next time. There are those who question and say, hmm, will Adam and Eve be in heaven? Well, obviously, they're not any more at fault than any of the rest of us. Just because it started with them doesn't mean that they don't get heaven. So that's kind of a mute point to argue on that one. But here's a question for you. Was Kion, Cain, was he ever accepted? Did he ever make a right sacrifice? Where did he end up? Did he end up going into the heart of the earth, to, into a paradise? Did he not? In other words, was Cain ever saved? Good question. It doesn't say because he just went off. There's a little more behind it than just doesn't say. I'll take us into some Hebrew meaning and some Hebrew words. Okay, so what do we have to read to find out? Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now, that's just a thought question for you to do exactly what you just did. Bring me your idea why you think what you think out of the scripture, out of even the English. You've got your Hebrew point right there. Never mentioned Cain. I'm sorry? I said in Hebrews, Cain was not mentioned. Okay, there's another point. Write down your points. You're doing very well. You're thinking and you're using the word of God to answer the question. I give you gold crown, A++, and all the rest of the goodies. <laughs> I don't have a Google thing to say. You, you already told us that there is a way that's called the way of Cain, so... <laughs> so I uh -oh. think... did the teacher get the answer to the exam? And here's Doris saying, I can't even Google, but I'm getting the answer. <laughs> You're doing exactly what I want. Think about it from the Word of God. What verses could you use to back up your view? You know, because there are those who want to say this or they'll want to say that. Find verses, because we don't stand on anything because Rochelle said it. We don't stand on anything because any other person says it. We stand on everything because we can say, the Word of God says. And then be able to say it so that you don't pull the blooper like I did where I've got to find that verse in Deuteronomy now about being guilty of the whole law. I can even picture on my Bible where, you know, where it is on the page. Maybe I can find it fast while we close <laughs> this class off. I'd love to give it, but anyone who wants it ahead of time, remind me, 
um, or I'll try to remember to send out the text. Uh, otherwise, it's two weeks for you to get the answer. By the time this video goes up, though, I'll have done an addendum that will include the answer. Okay, Roger? That's what we're supposed to do last time, too. Yes, I know. Yeah. But I did do it in this one. I'll probably still go back and add in. That's the clean that I wrote that in. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm looking just to see. I see we're way past. So for the sake of those who need to go, um, you know what? It may be the right verse. It, it is. I think it comes out of the Hebrew. So let me just throw in here, and I'll back it up later. But um, Deuteronomy 27, 26 does look like it is the right verse. And it's saying that when he, he, okay, let's just read it. Cursed be he who confirms not all. That when we get into that word all in the Hebrew, it's showing it is all of the law. That if they don't keep all of the words, it's like all means all or it doesn't mean, you know, anything. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Either all have or we've got to throw out, you know, our understanding of the word of God. I believe that that's where it is, that it comes out of the Hebrew backing that up, that it is all. If you're not keeping it all, you're cursed. It didn't say you can keep two-thirds, you can keep seven-eighths, you can keep it 99% of the time. It's a full, complete, all the law, all the time. So I think you did give me the right verse. I just needed to see it here. Um, yeah, I think that's it. It might tie it in with Galatians 3.10. Let me run over there real fast and see what that says. Galatians 3 and verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it's written, Cursed is everyone that confirms not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So there you go again, you're all. That it's showing you it is. You have to keep it all or you're guilty of it all. It's a, it's a the whole enchilada. <laughs> You don't get to take a bite. You don't get to pick and choose. It's a whole enchilada. <laughs> All the one that you, you, you read, Rochelle, uh, um, was that the New King James Version out of your Bible? Could have been. Could have been. The 21, 26? Yes. yes. What, what version are you reading from? I uh, Just King James. It might say it about the same. Yeah, because my, my, that, and that's what I have because... It does say confirm all the words of this law by observing them. Okay. I can go in real fast for those of you who want to stay. For those who don't, I apologize because I should be closing in prayer, but I can do this real fast. I've got a Bible program, and if it'll come up, um, why isn't it? I can do it fast on my phone. I can get the verse, and I can go into a Hebrew interlinear. It's not that I am that good with Hebrew, but I can, with help, follow it. And I can call up Deuteronomy 27, 26 real quick and see what it says there, if that gives us any more of a hint. But I think we've pretty well answered it. Um, so thank you, Rhonda. You got the right. And I give you that crown that I gave Dora. She gets to share it with you. <laughs> 27 and verse 26. And then I tell it that I want the Hebrew, the interlinear, because I can't do it on my own. My daddy could. Sorry, Dad. Hey, his fault too. He should talk me more. <laughs> um, okay, it's in. Uh, you've got yeah, you've got a breakdown that might help me also. I've gone back into the word debar, which is speech. So it's not. It, it's I can't get it that fast out of the Hebrew, but it's something that we've come to understand. Um, Yeah, um, a word, a matter, a thing, a cause. It's showing us in its entirety. It may be more of an understood. Uh, let me work on that because it may be more that, that we're just understanding. Again, like I say, all will mean all always or we're in trouble, you know. So, uh, but it may be sometimes the words are put together. Uh, Greek does this also where it takes us three or four words in English, but it's all one in the Hebrew, and it may be that, that we get that all in that word. But I'll have to dig and see if I can get some sources that help me. Um, but we know that, that we're right according to it. One sin would keep us out of heaven. Because if one sin could be allowed in, what's going to end up in heaven? One begets another one begets another one. Yes, Dora. But we're under grace. Yes. Okay, so that all of 
All this right. thing doesn't apply to us. Right, because of grace. Yes. That under the law <coughs> they were cursed. <coughs> under grace were removed from the condemnation. That's why when people say, oh, there's no law. No, no, no. We can't say that. Is it ever right to kill, to murder, to yeah. steal? No, God didn't take away law. You take away law, you got anarchy. You've got if you right. don't yeah. if you take away law, go drive on the the streets mm -hmm. with no laws. <laughs> Hello, how long do you think you'll live? Yeah. Not very. But the condemnation, and that's what Hebrews eight, uh, Hebrews, sorry, Romans eight, especially. There is there now, therefore, no condemnation to those. Let me let me read it to you, so you know I'm saying it right. Uh, because that's what's been removed for us. He took the condemnation from us. Um, and in essence, we're looked at as keeping the law, as fulfilling the law. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. See, you're, you're freed from the penalty you're freed from the condemnation obviously you're not freed from oh now i don't have to obey law no no and paul even addresses that when people say oh now because of grace we don't have to worry about we can just go and sin because we've got grace he says god forbid that's not where it's at you know that's not what it's about but yes because we are under grace we're not under that condemnation and thankfully because that's my whole point Cain did his best, and it wasn't perfect, so it wasn't accepted by God. It wasn't what God required, and it wasn't perfect. Anything that falls short of God's perfect standard, he can't accept. So if it was, um, if I had to do it, the thought that comes to my mind is, God help me, because I can't do it. You know, we can't. We can't. And anyone who has the audacity to say that they are perfect, well, right there is their first lie. Because <laughs> they're not perfect. And of course, it's not their first lie, but you get my point. So, any other comments, questions? I will close this in prayer and we'll go on. We'll go back to Passover and those who want to ask questions and sign up. But before we get there, any more on this? We're going to come back to this. We'll revisit it. Yes, Rowena. Uh, the one when they were having the curses at Mount Ebal and the blessings in Mount Gerizim, Moses actually said, keep all the commandments. Yes, yes. That yeah. I commanded me. So he said all. And I argue to this day with my dear Jewish brethren who want to pick and choose, I say, who gives you that right? Who says that you, have, you can obey these and it's okay, but you don't have to obey these? You know, if we can take cafeteria style, who gets to say what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad? Who gets to say when enough good has been done? Because my definition of what would be good enough to please God might not be your definition of that. So we'd have a free-for-all. We'd have never know. And the insecurity of never knowing. But God made it very clear. It's either 100% perfect up here with me, my level, <coughs> or you missed it. You know, you've missed the mark. That's what it means to sin. You miss the mark. So either you 100%, and that means from the moment you took your first breath, you never sinned as that little baby that <laughs> I've described in this class. You've lived perfectly every day of your life. You never spoke a wrong word. You never had a, a, a temper or a lie or a half the truth, whatever. I mean, come on, people. Who really has the audacity to say they lived perfectly? You know, so. But thankfully, it's all on God. It's not on me. Again, do I want to please him and do right? Absolutely. But I'm so thankful he didn't say, Rochelle, you got to earn it. You've got to merit it. Do enough brownie points. You know, let's work here. You know, you need to work a little longer. You need to work a little harder. You know, you need to shore up in this area. You know, well, you, you're good here now, but look at this other area. I'd never make it. I'd never make it. None of us would. No, none of us would. <coughs> okay, other comments? It's yes. like the Jew nowadays. You know, he doesn't know from year to year if he's going to pass the muster and that baby will be saved or not, or he's going to have to 
the when worry the, a whole year again. Yeah, the when the, the the religious Jew is trying to please God and trying to do it, he has to make sacrifices. I'm sorry, substitutes for the sacrifices right. because he can't. And so, how does he know? You know, and I'll say to that Jewish person who says, "Oh well, we substitute prayers and we substitute giving <clears throat> to the poor and we substitute this and that." Well, where did God say you could do that? Where did God say that's an acceptable substitute? Yeah. Nowhere. Nowhere. You know, so why do you get the right to say that you can change what God said? You know, so, and then I'll ask him, okay, so are we all condemned from 70 AD on? We could make a sacrifice. If I wanted to today, I cannot make a sacrifice on the altar in the temple, the only acceptable place to make that sacrifice. I don't have when to do it for me. There isn't an altar. There, it's not there. Are we all condemned? Obviously not. That's not our God. He said, you don't need that earthly altar because I have already, the Lamb of God, made that permanent, not yearly sacrifice. I made the permanent one and put the blood on the permanent mercy seat in the permanent tabernacle that opens up your permanent home forever. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I'm just a little excited. <laughs> so thankful. So thankful. So thankful. Ah, more comments, more questions. I can go on till midnight. <laughs> okay, let's close it in prayer. Then we'll open up the mics. We can keep talking about this. We will talk about Passover. And we'll come back in. I'll miss you next week, I'm sorry, but please understand the days will be very packed, very full. And I know I'm human. <laughs> very aware of it nowadays. <laughs> Ro Rochelle, could yes. you just text next week? You're not going to text us. Could you just text the invitation to the uh, Passover? I should do that sooner than later. So I yeah. will, by your suggestion, Lord help me remember, I will send out the flyer via text. Yeah, the flyer. Yeah, to so all of you who we, get we could send it too if you wanted to invite somebody who was thinking of right. who to invite. Right. And if you'd prefer to have it in your email, let me know that. Make sure I have it. No, your the text would be faster. Yes. For you, Rowena, that's good. For those who don't okay. use the cell phones oh, but they okay. use email, yeah. I want them to know I can send it that way. Yes. For those of you, sorry. Uh, no. sorry. No problem. Yeah. For those of you who need me to hand it to you, I can put it in the mail. I can hand it if we meet, you know. But no, no apologies. I just want you to, I want everybody to realize I'll meet them whatever way. But we should get it into your hands now because it's going to be here before we know it. You know, it's coming fast now. Because so. even just sending them the text, I mean, you know, the, the flyer, even through text, even if they don't come, they might have questions for us. Yes. Because uh, the yes. first time I heard the word Passover, Savior, I said, why is there a Savior attached to the Passover? You know, because people just talk about Passover. And how many so, know where the word Passover came from? If you've been with me, you know. You might not remember, mm -hmm. but do you remember? Can you answer from Scripture? Because that's where it comes from. And why mm -hmm. is there the word Seder? And what's the Haggadah? And what's, why do we do all these symbols? I'll tell you, one of the best blessings I ever had in my sharing of the Passovers was a 97-year-old woman that came up to me. She had gotten saved at 95. And at 97, she was Jewish, at 97, she attended her first Messiah in the Passover Seder. And she came up to me afterwards. I can still see her face, and I can still see her tears. And she says, now I know what it all means. Now I know what it's all about. <coughs> I did this year after year. I never mm. knew what it meant. But the Lord had opened her eyes. And oh, what a picture of him it is. I love sharing it. I, I mean, you're in one of my highlights. This is my, I don't know what it is for you guys. Maybe your Christmas. <laughs> I don't know. Because I love Christmas also, so I don't know how to say it. But it is a highlight to get to share <coughs> The Passover, the Jewishness, the meaning behind the symbols. Why do we do this? And the children are supposed to ask that. How come? Why are we doing this? Scripture says they're going to ask. 
You know, the kid who's having to sit through it again and again and again. How come? This is why. <laughs> you know? So come and be a part. Come and share. Pray for it. Pray for the, those who are there to be blessed that are believers and those who are not yet believers to have their eyes open so they can say like that woman did, now I know why. Now I get it. It's all there. And that's our God. From Bereshit to Revelation, he's revealing himself in different symbols, in different pictures, in different ways, because we all are reached in different ways. So, okay, do I close in prayer? Okay. Lord God, thank you. We are full, we are at this moment satiated. But we thank you that as soon as we're hungry again, you'll give us our next meal and our next one and our next one. And Lord, may we eat from you and may we drink from the, the living water continually that we might be taken into the depths of the well of our salvation, that we might have it spring up into everlasting life and into that abundance that fills us with your joy that puts it on from the inside out that others might see and be drawn to you also. At this very special time of the year on our calendars, Lord, as we celebrate the true meaning behind Passover, behind Resurrection Day, as we see the full story, as we know that you gave your all, that you left the crown of heaven to wear a crown of thorns, that you came to pay a debt that you did not owe, that we might have our debt forgiven because we did owe it. Lord, you are just beyond our words. And our hearts just swell up and, and we just rejoice and we thank you and we fall on our faces before you in such adoration and such humbleness that you reached down to save a sinner like me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this class. Thank you for the blessing. Now may we absorb the word that we've heard today, Lord, and be more like you because of it. And thank you that we can look forward to eternity with you. Praise you forever. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm done. <laughs> okay, Anyone? My teacher, I only have to page 17. Oh. So you need 18 on. I think everybody else only has 18, but I managed last night to type up page 19, so I need to send it out. So I'll get you. If you want to wait until um, I'm sure through the questions, I can get it for That's you. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Next time. Okay. Okay, in addition, as I referenced at the end of this class today, instead of adding it on to this class, I'm going to go ahead and bring it back next time that I teach, which uh, today's class was April 13th, and I'll bring it back on April 27th because we will have no class on April 20th. But we'll talk in a little more detail on having to keep, I'm sorry, having to keep every, uh, every, every law. I can't think of what I'm trying to say. Out of, you know, you're guilty of one, you're guilty of it all if you break one. Wow. You can see why I'm going to wait and do it when I'm fresh and when I've had time to put in a little bit into the Hebrew, what it's saying there, the meaning that we get to fully understand that. So rather than get an addendum at the end of class today, as I have referred to, please tune in on the April 27th teaching at the beginning of class. Before we go back into Genesis, I'll refer to it. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with me and my my little <laughs> issues, whatever I should call it. Lord bless you. Shalom.